Hello, everyone, and welcome to Silver Streams, the weekly podcast from the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center's programming team. I'm Todd Hitchcock, AFI Silver's Director of Programming. I'm Abby Algar, Associate Film Programmer. And I'm Ben Delgado, the Assistant Film Programmer. And today we're going to discuss the latest offerings in AFI Silver's virtual screening room, as well as recommending some other titles to view at home. So new this week, we have the documentary, The Reason I Jump, an immersive exploration of neurodiversity through the experiences of non-speaking autistic people from around the world. We have Blizzard of Souls, the 2020 Oscar selection from Latvia and an official selection of the 2020 AFI European Union Film Showcase. And we also have the documentary Beautiful Something Left Behind, which was the winner of the documentary feature Grand Jury Award at the 2020 South by Southwest Film Festival. This week, we're going to preview all of the new films premiering this week in AFI Silver's virtual screening room, recap the films that opened in previous weeks that are currently available to view there, and close with our programmer's picks section, where we discuss other ideas for films to watch at home. Happy New Year to everyone. This is episode 33 of Silver Streams and our first episode in 2021, following a two-week break during the holidays and the end of 2020. We began this podcast back in April of 2020, shortly after we closed the doors to the AFI Silver Theater and launched our virtual cinema program. And we'd like to thank everyone for listening to the podcast. It's been fun to see the number of listeners rise over time. Uh, and also to see so many listeners uh, tuning in from abroad. We've had people listen in now from over 30 different countries around the world, which is amazing and something we never, never would have imagined would have happened. Uh, so thank you all for listening. And our recent episodes have been especially popular, including episode 28, where we discussed our Noir City International Festival and interviewed Eddie Muller. Uh, the host of TCM's Noir Alley and the founder and president of the Film Noir Foundation. And that episode uh, is just about to become next couple people who listen to it will become our most popular episode ever. Also, episode 30, where we discussed 1980s camp-tastic sci-fi spectacular Flash Gordon. And episode 31, where we discussed the comedy Nine to Five, starring Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Dolly Parton. And both of those last two films celebrated 40th anniversaries in December. Uh, all of these have been uh, amongst our, our, our most popular episodes of late. Thank you all for listening. And also a big thank you to everyone for screening films at home from our virtual screening room. By screening these films at home, you are supporting AFI Silver. We receive a portion of the proceeds for every virtual cinema transaction that you make. So by screening at home this way, you are supporting our theater during our extended physical closure. Thank you all for supporting the silver during these challenging times. And a reminder, you can find all of the titles that we are currently offering to screen at home on our website at afi.com slash silver. And if you have any feedback or questions, you can email us at silverinfo at afi.com. You can find the podcast each Friday posted on our website at afi.com slash silver in our Friday e-blast and across our social media channels. And we are in all the places where you usually find your podcasts. And as I remind you every week, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. That way you get it every Friday. As soon as we post it, you'll see it in your podcast app of choice. Um, and of course, uh, rate the podcast. Rating the podcast on the software you use is very helpful. Giving us a star rating in Apple Podcasts or even writing a review. Uh, those things help the, the show immensely, um, as does just telling a friend. So, you know, tell your friends, tell your family, let everyone know about the Silver Streams podcast. And let everyone know about the virtual screening room and our various programs and series while you're at it. Because um, I think you have been doing that because we've had a very busy time over the last uh, couple of holiday weeks. Uh, so big thanks to everyone who streamed something from the virtual screening room, from the EU showcase, from the Wong Kar Wai retrospective and also our holiday classics series. It's, it's been a very busy couple of weeks. And I'm very pleased to report that the top performing title for the first weekend of 2021 is yet again, Italian filmmaker Pietro Marcello's Martin Eden, 
which is an adaptation of Jack London's 1909 novel uh, set in Naples uh, in the late 20th century and starring Luca Marinelli in the lead role as Martin Eden. And the film has been appearing on many, many end of year best of lists, including Barack Obama's, by the way. And it was also named by the New York Times' Manola Dargis as the top film of 2020. And again, this is an encore presentation from our 2019 AFI European Union Film Showcase. So what can I say? We have very good taste. And then another film continuing to do well after returning from our most recent AFI EU Film Showcase. In fact, the winner of our audience award is Denmark's Oscar submission, Another Round, directed by Thomas Winterberg and starring Danish superstar Mads Mikkelsen as a disillusioned high school teacher who sets out with his colleagues to test the theory that humans function optimally when they are very slightly drunk all of the time. Needless to say, the theory has a few holes in it, which the film explores thoroughly and in some very darkly comedic ways. And the film also boasts the best ending of 2020. And it helps to remember when watching this ending, which if you haven't seen it, watch the film ASAP, that Mads Mikkelsen was actually trained as a gymnast and dancer. And yes, this is him performing in the scene. It's not a body double just in case you need another reason to love Matt Mickelson. And I think we're looking at one of the front runners for the best international feature Oscar with this film. So very happy to see that so many of you are enjoying and appreciating it. And it seems that some of you are also enjoying and appreciating 76 Days, um, despite its heavy subject matter. Uh, the film continues to be a hit in the virtual screening room and rightfully so. Uh, the documentary takes a look at the frontline workers in four hospitals in Wuhan, China, in the immediate aftermath of the COVID outbreak. And it's a really powerful human story uh, of a crisis that we're all very much still living through. So um, happy to see people are interested in uh, checking this one out. It's a really good documentary. But you've also found some fun escape in the virtual screening room uh, in The Passionate Thief, uh, this new 4K restoration of a New Year's Eve comedy caper starring Anna Magnani, Ben Gazzara, and the great and hilarious Toto. Uh, this one is a bit of a rarity and is being presented here for the first time for home viewing in the US. It was a part of our holiday classic series, which has since concluded. Um, that one wrapped up on the third, uh, but the film is now held over in our virtual screening room proper and it's gonna be having an open-ended run. So, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, be sure to catch The Passionate Thief. And other top performers in our virtual screening room right now include Louis van Beethoven. Uh, this is the Beethoven biopic that recently screened in our EU Film Showcase. And Beethoven's 250th birthday was just celebrated in December. So this is the perfect time to check out this film. Uh, also the documentary Coup 53, and this is a return engagement of one of our big hits from last summer. It's a deep dive into the archival evidence of the UK's involvement in the 1953 coup in Iran that deposed the democratically elected leader and installed the Shah in his place. Uh, the film also features Rafe Fiennes in a dramatic recreation of uh, an incendiary lost interview with a British MI6 officer involved in the coup. Uh, we're also featuring right now Zappa. This is Alex Winter's documentary profile of the brilliant and provocative musician featuring a treasure trove of rare and unseen performance footage from the Zappa vault. Spore, Agnieszka Holland's eco-thriller mystery based on the acclaimed novel, uh, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Togarchuk. And also Finding Ying Ying, Jenny Shi's award-winning documentary about the mysterious disappearance of Ying Zhang, a 26-year-old Chinese student who disappeared very soon after arriving in the U.S. to pursue her dreams of studying science. And rounding out our top 10 films in the virtual screening room right now, Shadow in the Cloud, which is an amazing action-adventure genre movie starring Chloe Grace Moritz that involves gremlins on a plane in World War II directed by Roseanne Liang. And we also just wrapped up our 
AFI European Union Film Showcase, which I mentioned, and thanks to all of you, it was a really big success. Uh, we had over 30,000 film streams over the course of the festival, and ticket and pass sales were comparable to what we would expect in a normal in-person year. And in fact, the festival did so well that we ended up extending a selection of the titles for an additional week through December 27th to give everyone some extra time. And many of you took advantage of those extra days for some film watching. So excellent choice and good on you for those who did. Um, so anyway, this would have been a great year any year, but we're really happy that we were able to pull this together virtually and that we were able to, to share this lineup of films with you and that everyone seemed to enjoy it. And we also have a number of EU alum in the virtual screening room right now and coming very soon, uh, including, as I've already talked about, our audience award winner, Another Round, um, which I already mentioned, people are still very keen to check out. Uh, our closing selection, Louis van Beethoven, the Swedish thriller, Breaking Surface, and then Latvian Oscar submission, Blizzard of Souls, which opens January 8th, which is today, if you're listening to the podcast, The Day It Drops. And then coming up, we have Akaza from Romania, which opens on January 15th. And then Hungarian Oscar submission, preparations to be together for an unknown period of time, very long title, opening on January 22nd. So lots coming up from the EU showcase. And then we also have a couple of titles coming up from our new African and Latin American film festivals, both opening on January 22nd. Sudan's Oscar submission, You Will Die at 20, and Identifying Features from, from Mexico, which was very popular in last year's uh, AFI Latin American Film Festival. And our Wong Kar Wai series uh, continues on in the virtual screening room featuring nine films from the Hong Kong master filmmaker. Uh, we have seven new restorations courtesy of Janice Films, Chunking Express, As Tears Go By, Days of Being Wild, Fallen Angels, Happy Together, the expanded director's cut of The Hand, and a newly restored version of his all-time masterpiece In the Mood for Love. Uh, and on top of those great films, we're also presenting Ashes of Time Redux and 2046. And like many of our series, uh, we have a pass that gets you access to, to all the films. So you can watch all nine films with that pass. Something that you should definitely take advantage of if you're going to watch, you know, a good handful of the films. It's a really good deal and gets, uh, gets you a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, hopefully people are checking out these Wong Kar Wai films. I think I've said it before on the podcast. He's one of my favorites and uh, really happy we're able to present this uh, in the virtual screening room. And also some new announcements for this week. Uh, look, be on the lookout for the... 2021 edition of the Capital Irish Film Festival, which will take place online March 4 through 14. And this is co-presented by Solas Nua. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the festival know that uh, AFI Silver has been hosting the Capital Irish Film Festival for the past several years and also know what a fun festival it is and always features a, a number of, of terrific films. Uh, at present, of course, it needs to be an online version of things, but we're very much looking forward to uh, presenting it this way and to continuing to present uh, the Capital Irish Film Festival in its um, regular uh, time slot in March. And this is going to be the 15th edition of the Capital Irish Film Festival. Uh, so be on the lookout uh, for announcements regarding the films this year. Um, passes are on sale now and look for the full lineup to be announced in early February. And then we are also announcing our next free online silent film presentation. And this will take place on Thursday, January 28th at 8 p.m. And the film is The Phantom Carriage, uh, featuring live musical accompaniment by Andrew Simpson. The Phantom Carriage is Victor Shostrom's 1921 masterpiece, a supernatural drama about the Grim Reaper passing the scythe to a new job applicant on New Year's Eve. And Andrew, of course, has played many events for us at AFI Silver over the years and most recently performed for Nosferatu back in October. And I know he's going to do something amazing with his score for this film uh, as well, like he did for, for us for Nosferatu a few months back. So 
mark this one on your calendars. You will pre-register on our website in order to watch the live stream on Thursday, January 28th at 8 p.m. Okay, so in addition to those upcoming special events, here are the films that we are debuting in our virtual screening room this week. And first up in the virtual screening room, we have The Reason I Jump. As the 2021 edition of Sundance looms on the horizon, this winner of the 2020 Sundance Audience Award in the World Cinema Documentary section is now opening up in virtual cinemas. And for longtime listeners, the title may sound familiar. It was actually my programmer's pick selection from the AFI Docs lineup back in June of 2020 on episode 12, Let Traverse de Gary. Based on the best-selling book by Naoki Higashida, The Reason I Jump is an immersive cinematic exploration in neurodiversity. It looks at the experiences of non-speaking autistic people from around the world. The film blends Higashida's revelatory insights into autism that were written when he was just 13 with intimate portraits of five remarkable young people. It opens up a window for audiences into an intense and really overwhelming but often joyful sensory universe. Moments in the lives of each of the characters are linked by Higashida's journey through an epic landscape. And narrated passages from his writing reflect on what autism means to him and others and how his perspective on the world differs and why he acts in the way that he does. The film distills all these elements into a sensually rich tapestry that leads viewers to Higashida's core message. Not being able to speak does not mean there is nothing to say. Higashida, who is the son of author David Mitchell, doesn't feature in the film himself, but of course his words do, translated into English by his mother, Kyoko Yoshida. Uh, They serve as the backbone for the five stories we see here. The film starts with Amrit, who lives in India. She lives with her mother and draws her emotions to communicate rather than speaking. Uh, Joss is a kid who lives in England with both of his parents um, and is really seen here prone to violent outbursts um, and exhibiting these scattered memories where he remembers something really vividly from when he was three years old or when it was just happened to him 30 minutes ago. It's a an interesting way that his brain processes memory. And we see Ben and Emma, who both live in Arlington, Virginia. And Ben plays hockey and is best friends with Emma. And we follow both of them as they work with Elizabeth Vossler, a speech therapist who specializes in teaching communication techniques to children who are nonverbal. The relationship between Ben and Emma is really something beautiful to behold. Um, At one point, uh, using an alphabet chart, uh, that Ben's been working on with Elizabeth. He, he expresses his like deep appreciation for his friend, saying that Emma is my North Star. And it, it's one of many really touching moments in the documentary. Um, and the final uh, subject here is Justina, who lives in Sierra Leone with her parents, um, as they struggle in their community where she and other autistic children are ostracized and, and are called possessed or witches even. Um, But there's a new school and a new government in in place that are really helping change uh, people's perceptions there. And despite what might seem like a very complex and heavy subject on paper, this film manages to beautifully capture all these experiences um, that live beyond the neurotypical without pandering and rightfully highlighting injustices and misconceptions that are steadily changing um, as autism becomes more and more destigmatized. Uh, It's a really great documentary. If you didn't get a chance to see it in AFI Docs, I hope you get a chance to check it out in our virtual screening room now that we're opening the film. Well, I know you were a big fan of this film from last year's Sundance ban, and I still haven't seen it, even though you highly recommended it on our AFI Docs podcast, so I still need to do it. But I do think it's going to make a very good and interesting pairing with the documentary that I'm going to talk about uh, very shortly. So... Hold on for that. Sneak peek at an upcoming double feature recommendation later on in the show. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think um, that is a, a nice um, coincidence that those two films are coming out this week. And yeah, now you have a chance to check this one out. And so does everybody else. Again, that's the reason I jump from our friends at Kino Lorber.
So next up in our virtual screening room this week is the Latvian film Blizzard of Souls. And this is another film that recently screened in our EU film showcase that is now opening, uh, commercially opening as part of our uh, virtual screening room titles. And this film is written and directed by Zintars Drybergs, based on a novel by Latvian author Alexanders Grins. And most of Grins' work was banned uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and by the way, Grins himself was executed by the Soviets in 1941. Blizzard of Souls has been a major box office hit in Latvia, uh, in fact, becoming the most watched film uh, since the restoration of uh, Latvian independence in 1991, so the last 30 years or so. And it was also recently selected to be the country's selection for the 2021 Oscars Best International Film category. Blizzard of Souls is a grim tale that takes place during World War I and follows the difficult coming of age of 16-year-old Arturs, who joins the Latvian riflemen of the Imperial Russian Army, along with his father and brother, after the family loses their home and their mother to the invading German army. And teenager Arturs imagines that war will be a glorious, victorious affair, uh, and is encouraged in that uh, vision of things by others around him, and that victory uh, will come to his side uh, relatively swiftly. Of course, Arturs is terribly mistaken on all counts, and will spend the next several years enduring unimaginable horrors. And the film does not stint on the graphic depictions of wartime violence. The story here bears comparison to other well-known novels and films, such as All Quiet on the Western Front and The Big Parade in terms of the disillusionment over romantic notions of war. But at the same time, it's combined with uh, a nationalistic nation-building resolution for a free and independent Latvian state, in, the case, in this case, uh, gaining its independence from imperial rule by Russia, uh, which is a different element slightly contradictory to the themes of those those other novels and films. But Blizzard of Souls was a fairly popular title in our EU film showcase that we just concluded. And we're looking forward to continuing to present the film now in its in its uh, wider commercial release. And if you did not get a chance to see it as part of the EU film showcase, here's your chance now. And once again, the film is in the running for the eventual Oscar nominations for Best International Film as Latvia's selection. So uh, I do encourage you to check this one out this week. Well, I've read quite a few comparisons between this film and Sam Mendes' film, 1917, uh, which, by the way, um, it was just announced this week, was the highest grossing film in the UK in 2020 because it actually made it into theatres before the pandemic. So... Interesting fact there. Um, but this this sounds thematically similar, if not really exactly the same in technique and scope. But would you say that if you enjoyed 1917, this is probably something that you'll appreciate and be interested in? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, 1917, of course, has the, the central conceit of the uh, seemingly unbroken shot all the way throughout. This is a different film, a much lower budget film, but um, as both of you know, I've taken quite an interest in World War I films, films uh, that explore the World War I era. And um, I think this is a, a fine entry in, in that category, including that it's showing us um, the Eastern Front and the experience of other nations uh, beyond the U.S., beyond the U.K., France, Germany. And very importantly, and hugely central to the story here, it's really a story about Latvians hard won independence from the Russian empire, which many people in America may not be aware of, but there was a stretch of time uh, following world war one with an independent Latvian state coming into being uh, before they were once again, subsumed into the Soviet union during world war two. And as I mentioned a moment ago, did not regain independence until 1991. So um, yeah, this, this story balances the sort of anti-war uh, loss of innocence and an experience gained of horrific wartime experience, but it's also very much connected with this Latvia should be a free state and we're going to build our new country post World War One. Uh, but again, if if World War One films are of interest, this is one that you should definitely check out.
All right. So that's Blizzard of Souls. And that's coming to us from our friends at Film Movement. So rounding out the new films in the virtual screening room this week is the documentary Beautiful Something Left Behind, which is coming to us from MTV Documentary Films, who are also bringing us 76 Days and Finding Ying Ying, which have both been very popular in the screening room, as we just mentioned. And so MTV Documentary Films are on a winning streak at the moment with their acquisitions and I hope this new edition will be just as popular as the other two have been so far and it certainly deserves to be so. So Beautiful Something Left Behind is directed by Danish documentarian Katrine Philp and was slated to have its world premiere at last year's South by Southwest Film Festival, which was unfortunately cancelled, but it did still end up being awarded the festival's prestigious documentary feature Grand Jury Award. And it then went on to screen at several virtual film festivals in 2020, including very recently at Doc NYC. And so we're really pleased that it's coming to virtual cinemas for even more people to see now. So the film addresses a topic that's rarely looked at in any real depth in cinema, exploring the grieving experiences of young children who have recently lost one or both parents. And while this sounds like an extremely sad and tough topic for a film, and it certainly is, what results is actually very life affirming and, and hopeful. And you come away from this film feeling like maybe as Adults, we have something to learn from the very honest, frank, and yes, heartbreaking, but also inspiring ways that these children come to terms with death and grief and incredible loss. The film focuses in on a counseling program in New Jersey called Good Grief, which offers a holistic approach to mourning, specifically for young children, giving them space to meet with other children who have also lost a parent or a sibling. And through play and group sessions, they help them learn how to cope with pain and learn to live with grief. The various counselors and mentors in the program encourage these kids not to be afraid to talk about death, to acknowledge their pain and their anger and their sadness, and ultimately help the children so that their loss isn't an isolating experience, but one that brings them together with others experiencing the same things. So if Mr. Rogers had created a program for bereaved children, I think it would probably look a lot like this. And appropriately, we see the whole process in the film almost exclusively through the eyes of the children participating in the program. And so over the course of the year, the film follows the program's weekly meetings, and it also tracks the progress of six of its participants, ranging in age from five to 11, all of whom have very different stories and situations, but all of whom are learning to process and live with the loss of one or both parents. And alongside fly on the wall footage of, of the group sessions at Good Grief and the daily home lives of these six children. Filmmaker Katrine Philp also interviews each of them. And these interviews are heartbreaking at times, but also sometimes humorous and heartwarming as we get to experience really difficult questions about life and death through these kind of open and curious minds and with an honesty rarely afforded to discussions of, of death. And as I mentioned, we see these kids as they navigate grief by embracing loss with honesty and bravery and humor. And I think we have plenty to learn from them. So the beautiful something left behind of the title of the film refers, of course, to the children left behind by the death of one or both parents. But I think it could equally refer to the love that we see surrounding these children in the wake of their losses, both in the tireless counselors at good grief, but also in the dedication of the remaining family members who are now caring for these children while themselves, of course, struggling with incredible loss. Uh, one of the kids we follow is a, a six-year-old boy called Peter. Uh, he's lost both his parents, his mother in a car accident and his father to an overdose or what Peter calls bad medicine. It's, it's sad. And he's now being raised by his uncle, CJ, and his grandma. And I think the scenes in the film following Peter and his uncle, CJ, who's this kind of quite young kind of New Jersey bro type, who you get the sense maybe didn't expect to be in a father role, but is embracing it nevertheless to the absolute best of his abilities. These scenes are among the most touching in the whole documentary. And I think you could definitely see a narrative adaptation of their story coming up at some point. Director Katrine Philp does a really great job at capturing all of this. This is actually her fourth 
full length documentary following 2014's Dance For Me, which was nominated for an Emmy Award, 2016's Home Sweet Home, which won a Danish Academy Award, and 2018's False Confessions, which uh, screened at the Los Angeles Film Festival and won a special jury prize there. And the amount of trust she's built with the subjects of Beautiful Something Left Behind is certainly a testament to her long experience and her skill as a documentarian tackling difficult topics. And the film is also very beautifully shot by Adam Morris uh, Philp, who is Katrine Philp's husband, by the way. And it gives a very intimate, immersive feel, which allows you very much to place yourself in these kids' shoes in a way. And sadly, the film also throws into relief the, the tragedy of people dealing with grief right now during the pandemic without you know, these in-person support systems and, and human connections necessarily to, to help them through it. So I think like 76 Days, this might not be the easiest watch in places. I think it raises some difficult questions, but ultimately it's an important watch and surprisingly one that will leave you hopeful. And as I mentioned, I think it would make a, a great pairing with uh, the reason I jump. Yeah, there really are so many similarities in, in terms of um, moments that are easy to watch, but ultimately leave you hopeful and um, also putting yourself in uh, the shoes of someone who you uh, may not know what they're, they're going through and um, being able to do that in a documentary, I think is uh, a really special skill and, and obviously it was pulled off here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm looking forward to catching up with this one and I don't know that I'll do the double feature since I've already seen the reason I jump, but um, uh, take a look at this one uh, when I get a chance in the virtual screening room. Yeah, definitely. I think you will appreciate it. I think you'll enjoy the, the cinematography as well. And uh, yeah, I think this is a really great pairing with, with that film. Okay, so again, that's Beautiful Something Left Behind coming to us from MTV Documentary Films. In addition to discussing the films we have available as virtual cinema, each week we also like to discuss some other ideas for films you can view at home, this being our Programmer's Picks section. And this week, changing it up a little bit, we're going to talk about picks for television series that we recommend. And first up is Ben. So it's kind of difficult to pin down or succinctly describe how to with John Wilson. Um, but HBO describes it as a docu-comedy series, which is mostly accurate, but it's also kind of limiting in its scope. Um, if you're familiar with the Comedy Central series Nathan For You, or Nathan Fielder in general, um, who's a pretty hands-on executive producer here um, for the show, How To with John Wilson. Um, then you're halfway there to understanding what this, uh, this show disguises as a set of tutorials is. But what starts as a framing device for each episode with Wilson ostensibly teaching the audience how to make small talk, improve your memory, or cook the perfect risotto, always goes way beyond that initial topic uh, with people on the street interviews, B-roll and his signature voiceover combining to tackle lots of weighty existential questions and give voice to some truly eccentric characters along the way. John Wilson is a New York documentarian who is uh, obsessed with capturing the seemingly mundane in his neighborhood and beyond. For over a decade, he's been making these shorts that uh, have grown a cult following on his Vimeo page. And a couple of the shorts uh, were even recently selected for the New York Film Festival in the past few years. And with over a decade of experience uh, making these short films, uh, used to be about 10 to 20 minutes, now 30 minutes um, in length, he's gotten really adept at this unique amalgamation of documentary styles and a very particular rhythm that he learned in his first job out of college, uh, where he cut together a video of the most incriminating footage from hours and hours of tapes for a uh, PI. And uh, Wilson has described those, uh, um, those pieces of footage as being kind of a, a collage of different weird images of people doing strange things, which it, once you see the show, you'll, you'll understand um, how that tone uh, translates to um, uh, how to. 
And now with a writing team, a travel budget, editors, and additional camera people, he's able to make six 30-minute pieces a year rather than one 10-minute video a year, which was the pace he was on beforehand uh, for the past decade. As a, as a one-man crew, um, that's what he was able to churn out. And since this is a docu-series, the episodes themselves are really created in the editing, pulling from hundreds of hours of footage uh, for the first season shot over two years. And even though the show is extensively written in terms of the voiceover and the structure of each episode, uh, much of that writing is actually informed by the footage first. So of the writer's room, Wilson has said, everyone's contributing. We're all trying to think of the funniest way to use real material because the heart of the show is that you can believe the images. And, and that's something that at its core is what how-to is about, uh, believability, or more accurately, sincerity. Um, given the peculiarity of the interview subjects, there's, there's an understandable fear that uh, the people you're seeing on screen are gonna be used as punchlines, and you would be exploiting the cringe factor for, for laughs, like something like Tim and Eric, or even the aforementioned Nathan for you. Um, but even in the face of the most outlandish eccentricities, Wilson remains really empathetic and open. And he's dead set on keeping that perspective in, in the show on HBO. Um, after watching a version of the pilot episode, How to Make Small Talk, uh, Wilson was really beside himself at what he just saw. Um, he said, I couldn't stand watching something that didn't feel sincere. It's obvious to me when I'm being puppeteered in the tone of my voiceover and I don't want it to feel inauthentic. So at the end of the day, I need to make sure that I actually believe everything I'm saying. That's the most important part. So what is How To With John Wilson? Is it cringy? Uh, definitely, um, but it always feels real and it's always really funny. Uh, it's such a singular project and vision that shows us a gritty and authentic side of New York, rarely seen on screen. You kind of just have to surrender yourself to the weird journey and get on John Wilson's wavelength as he tells you how to make small talk, put up scaffolding, improve your memory, cover your furniture, split the check, and cook the perfect risotto. So I haven't gotten into the particulars of what happens in the series because I think that's a big part of the appeal. Watching the show and how the episodes evolve and unfold and what people reveal about themselves when confronted with the camera. How To With John Wilson was a real revelation for me watching it this way, coming in mostly blind, and hopefully I've sold at least a few listeners in checking it out without divulging any real specifics. Hey, New York. There are countless opportunities to make small talk in a big city. It can be extremely rewarding if you know how to do it right. So do you have strong thoughts about scaffolding? No, not at the moment. Is there a place I can go where referees hang out? Do you know a good recipe for risotto? Pardon me? Do you cover your own furniture at home? No. Do you know why these are so blown up? All right, this is as high as we can go. Is it more authentic to have your foreskin? Is it a sin if I cheat on my taxes? Was I making you uncomfortable? No. Actually, yeah, a little bit. Have you ever had a pet that died? How did it the chicken? Do you think mankind is going to make a comeback? The world is full of people that need to get something off their chest. So buckle up, baby, because uh, things are about to get pretty wild. Ben, this series was reviewed in The New Yorker magazine back in November, and the writer Dan Peepingbring compared John Wilson's approach as a filmmaker as being a combination of Les Blank, Frederick Wiseman, and Jeff Krulik, uh, which is a pretty wonderful uh, combination right there, description, uh, and it sounds pretty apt um, uh, to hear you describe it. Uh, how does how does that uh, register with you? Yeah, I think you're right. It's a an eclectic list of filmmakers. One that describes it pretty well. One that describes his approach pretty well. Um, so yeah, I, and I was glad to see. I saw the article that you're talking about as well, and I was glad to see Jeff Krulik there. That was a nice a nice shout out and uh, well deserved. Um, in, in its comparison. So if any of our listeners um, have come to see any of Jeff's work at the Silver, definitely a good place to start, a good entry point. If you're a fan of his things, then you're going to be a fan of uh, how to. 
Well, I recently watched the first episode of this series at your recommendation, Ben, and I did basically laugh and cry nonstop throughout the whole thing. Uh, This is exactly the type of mixture of humor and pain and unsentimentality and self-depreciation and weirdness that I love for some reason, who knows what that says about me. And that honestly, I think is actually a bit rare in American film and TV. Sorry. Uh, So I'm really excited to watch the rest of the series, especially after hearing you talk a little bit more about it. So thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you liked it. And I think that we have similar tastes in that sort of um, laughing and crying at the same time uh, in whether we're watching TV or or movies. And um, although they're pretty different things, I think if you're a fan of Peep Show, this kind of is the same Venn diagram in terms of uh, sad, dark things, but really laugh out loud, funny things. So maybe uh, our Peep Show fandom uh, comes together here as well. I think so. Always aim to talk about Peep Show at least once a day, don't we, Ben? (laughs) Yeah, and we don't bring it up enough on the podcast. So another shout out, a plug for Peep Show. (laughs) Look for a coming episode. And How To with John Wilson is available on HBO Max currently. Uh, season one just wrapped um, in November. Uh, it just finished its run, rather. And uh, season two is coming out hopefully sometime in 2021. They just greenlit it uh, in December. Uh, so only six episodes, 30 minutes each. I highly recommend watching How To With John Wilson. Well, my TV pick is very different uh, to that. Um, it's actually a series or an anthology of five films. Yes. Uh, they're collectively named small acts and directed by Oscar winning and Turner prize winning British filmmaker and artist, Steve McQueen, who of course, American audiences will know from his 2013 Academy award winner, 12 years a slave, uh, with which he actually became the first black director of a best Oscar picture winner and 2018's crime thriller Widows starring Viola Davis, which is a big favorite of the AFI Silver programming team. And with Small Axe, McQueen is venturing into entirely new territory in terms of form and content, both within his own artistic output and also within the film and TV industries at large. The five films in the Small Axe series range in runtime from around 60 minutes to two hours. Uh, They're each narratively independent and very different, but they're all thematically entwined in that as a collection, they explore a variety of stories centered on the West Indian or Afro-Caribbean community uh, in London in the mid 1960s through the mid 1980s. And while I mentioned that McQueen has already explored black American history with 12 Years a Slave and also British history uh, in his 2008 feature debut, Hunger, about the 1981 Irish hunger strike, Small Acts marks the first time that McQueen has addressed Black British history on film, which of course is very significant uh, and personal for him as a Brit who grew up in West London with a mother from Trinidad and a father from Grenada, uh, both of whom came to the UK as part of the Windrush generation of of Caribbean immigrants who came to the UK uh, to help rebuild in the post-World War II period. And of course, the reality that this generation found upon reaching the UK was not quite as welcoming and full of opportunity as it was cracked up to be. Actually, it was a cold, rainy, racist and hostile place where they would struggle to be accepted right into the 21st century, as in right up to now. And it's the stories of this first generation of Caribbean immigrants and their children, the first generation born and raised in the UK, so really Steve McQueen's generation, that Small Axe explores in great depth across class, across generations, across history, politics, culture, in a way that is completely and shockingly, when you think about it, unprecedented in British cinema and TV. So the five films are available in the US as an anthology series on Amazon Prime. Uh, They dropped one a week starting in November and now all five are available. And in the UK, they were aired on the BBC each Sunday, uh, again, starting in November. And they quickly became popular appointment viewing across the country. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth on all of the films because we don't have 
five hours. And I think each one has enough material for an entire podcast and maybe an entire podcast series. But I'll just give you a quick overview of each of the titles. So the series starts with a film called Mangrove, which recounts the real life 1971 trial of the Mangrove Nine, who are a group of black activists accused of, quote unquote, incitement to riot after uh, protesting uh, the police brutality and harassment being inflicted on a Trinidadian restaurant in Notting Hill uh, called The Mangrove of the film's title. And to be clear, these were peaceful protesters. Uh, It's not like they tried to storm the US Capitol or anything insane like that. So this film runs around two hours and I think it's the closest thing to a traditional theatrical feature among the five titles. It's a really gripping courtroom drama. Uh, It's a vital depiction of some essential but relatively unknown British history, which, by the way, as far as I know, is not taught in schools in the UK. Uh, And since this trial marked the first uh, judicial acknowledgement of behaviour motivated by racial hatred in the London Metropolitan Police, I think making it part of our national curriculum might be a bit overdue. Uh, The film stars Black Panther breakout Letitia Wright, uh, as real life figure Althea Jones LeCoint, uh, one of the Mangrove Nine and an actual Black Panther. Uh, in fact, one of the leaders of the British Black Panthers in the 60s and 70s. And by the way, if you didn't know there were British Black Panthers, uh, which I'm sure many British people don't even know, uh, there were. And that's just another reason to watch this series. So next up in the series is Lovers Rock which takes place on a single evening at a house party in the 1980s in West London and basically tracks the budding of a new romance between two of the party goers over the course of the night. And this one is just absolutely joyful and immersive to watch. It's shot in such a way that you actually feel like you're in the front living room of this terrace house, in this party, in the 1980s, drinking Red Stripe. And right now, it will make you long for a time when we'll all be able to cram that many people into one room again with what was probably, considering the amount of smoke in the room, pretty bad ventilation. Um, And of course, as the film's title suggests, it has an excellent lovers rock and reggae soundtrack. It has fantastic extended dance sequences. It has some acapella renditions of lovers rock tracks by the whole cast. And it also has some amazing costume design by Oscar-winning costume designer Jacqueline Duran, who most recently did Greta Gerwig's Little Women, by the way. Uh, I think you could call this one a musical, uh, which is actually how, how Steve McQueen himself has described it. And then following on after Lovers Rock is Red, White and Blue, which is set in the mid-1980s. And like Mangrove, this one is focused on real historical events, in this case, on the life of British police officer and reformer Leroy Logan, who was a founding member of the Black Police Association. And so we see Logan decide in the film to go into the police force after seeing his father assaulted by the police, uh, you know, believing, hoping that he can change the institution from within. Um, And of course, this is a notion that unsurprisingly leads to some painful confrontations and some ostracization from his family and community. And of course, the British police come out looking just as racist from the inside as as they do from the outside. This film raises uncomfortable, complex questions, and of course, ones that are very relevant right now more than ever. Um, The film stars John Boyega in the lead role as Leroy Logan. He is really fantastic. Um, American audiences, of course, know Boyega for his role in the most recent Star Wars reboots, although I have been a fan since Joe Cornish's 2011 Attack the Block, a classic. And there's a really great moment in the film when Leroy tells his friend he's joining the force, the police force, and the friend just responds, what, like a Jedi or something, which I think had to be intentional. So good one, Steve McQueen and co-writer Caution Newland on that one. And then next up is a film called Alex Wheatle. And this is another look at the experience of a real life figure, uh, this time the British children's author, Alex Wheatle. And the film looks at Wheatle's involvement in the 1981 Brixton uprising, again, sparked by police brutality and his subsequent imprisonment. And this is another clear look at institutional racism in the UK police force, but it's also a story of a young artist coming into his own and finding his own path in life. And Alex Wheatle, by the way, is now one of the most famous and awarded children's authors in the UK. And my friend just told me she took a writing course and he was her teacher and he was amazing. 
And then the last film in the anthology is called Education. And I think this is probably the most autobiographical in the series. Uh, Steve McQueen has said it is based in large part on his own experiences as a young black man who felt failed basically by the British education system. Um, it's set in the 1970s. It follows a 12 year old boy who Kingsley, who uh, dreams of becoming an astronaut, but he's dubbed disruptive in school by his teachers. He's moved to a school for children with special educational needs where the kids are basically completely neglected left to their own devices. And we see in the film how this move actually symbolizes a type of educational segregation, one that very much happened in the UK in this time period. So again, this is a film about the history of institutional racism in the UK, this time in the educational system, but it does end on a hopeful note of resistance. And of course, knowing that this story is based in part on the Queen's own educational experience and that he fought back against that to become one of the most celebrated British filmmakers in history, of course, gives you the feeling that despite the odds, Kingsley, this character in the film, will do great, even if sadly as, as an exception rather than the rule. So we've all chosen TV series as picks this week. And of course, because of its unique format and its release in a moment in which films originally intended as theatrical releases are being released virtually like TV. Uh, there's an ongoing debate around uh, this film or TV series about whether uh, small acts should in fact be considered television or cinema, whether all five films should be considered a single film in terms of award considerations or as a series of films or as a TV series or what. Um, you know, the hot debate in film circles right now is whether this project should be going for Emmy consideration or Oscar consideration, or if it should be submitted as individual films or as a whole. And, you know, considering everything going on right now, that's a relatively minor debate in the grand scheme of things. But I do think it's one worth mentioning, uh, since it further highlights how Steve McQueen and the team he put together on this project are really breaking barriers in every sense of the word. Several of the films in the series, uh, Mangrove, Lovers Rock, Red, White and Blue, were selected for and debuted at major film festivals, including Cannes and New York and London. And then the LA Film Critics Award recently kind of muddied the water a bit further by naming the series as a whole their Best Picture Award winner. Uh, but whether you consider this film or cinema or TV or some hybrid, I you know, I will mention that the whole series was specifically made to air on BBC television. Uh, the project was conceived of by McQueen as more of a traditional TV series, which would follow one single family over the several decades. But it developed over the course of about 11 years with much research and soul searching on McQueen's part into five very distinct films. And McQueen himself refers to each quote unquote episode in the series as a film, rightly so, but is very explicit in, in stating that he made them for TV, uh, specifically because he wanted his mum to be able to watch them and having them air on the BBC instead of being released in theatres would make it easier for her to do that. So the decision to release the films on TV and especially in the UK on the BBC, which is of course free, was really intended to maximize accessibility and remove potential barriers uh, to access. And uh, I think it's working pretty well as, as far as I can tell. Um, another debate around this series is whether each film or installment should be considered individually or as a whole, particularly in terms of award consideration, as I mentioned. And again, I think that's probably a slightly pointless debate, but I'll quickly address it. Uh, you don't need to watch all five films and each one does stand on its own and can be appreciated as its own distinct piece of work. But I do think that the intention, Steve McQueen's intention was for viewers to watch all five, to make the connections between them and to appreciate them as a full and complete piece of work. In terms of craftsmanship and artistry, um, all five films I think could certainly be considered cinematic uh, in their own right. And while I've been enjoying seeing them at home, would I watch them in a theater when that's the thing that's possible? Absolutely, yes, I would. That would be fantastic. In fact, all five films, despite having very different and distinctive visual looks, are shot by the same DP, uh, Antiguan cinematographer Shabir Kirshner, who, by the way, Ben, was the cinematographer on Skate Kitchen, one of your favorites. 
And he really used a variety of, of styles and techniques across the five films. He used 35 millimeter on Mangrove and Red, Wet and Blue, Digital for Lovers Rock and Alex Wheatle, and then he used 16 millimeter on Education. And in each case, the chosen format really does heighten storytelling and the tone and sense of place in, in each installment. So yeah, these, these films thematically are completely intertwined and inter interconnected. Uh, they all deal with the lived experiences of, of the West Indian community in London during this specific time period. They all address systemic racism in the UK and policing and the criminal justice system in education. But these films also all have um, in common this incredible joy and humor. Uh, there is celebration of life and culture and community. Music is a really big thing in all five of these films. Food is a big thing. Friendship and family are big things, sense of place, um, as are just the more mundane moments of, of daily life, uh, which are all kind of being represented here to an extent that they haven't really been before on the big or small screen. Uh, so is this cinema or is this TV? Is it one film or five? I don't really think it matters. Um, you should just watch it regardless. And you can do that because it's all available on Amazon right now. And I'll leave the last word on this topic with the cinematographer, Shabir Kirshner. Here's what he said. I'm becoming less and less interested in the parameters we've been told filmmakers should operate by in Western culture. For me, this isn't cinema. This is ancestral. In a time when our histories are fading, I want to be able to keep making choices that preserve that in any way possible. Aye, check one, two. Shout out to the ladies worldwide. You're as much to blame as I know you feel the same. I can see. types of human beings. They are not demoralized or defeated persons. They are leaders, but are rooted deep among those they lead. We mustn't be victims, but protagonists of our stories. Don't you think it's time things were different? As individuals, we have an impossible battle. As a collective, we stand a chance. If you are the big tree, we are the small X. Sharpen to cut you down. Well, Abby, as you know, I have a lot of uh, catching up work to do on uh, films uh, and series uh, released in the in the last half year or so, and this is absolutely at the top of that list. Um, hearing you walk us through the the uh, you know what's special about each episode in the series, uh, as well as the undeniable cinematic qualities of of each episode, um, one can understand how it has this sort of tweener aspect for for people's um, reception. But it's interesting. I, I think you'll agree that uh, we're we're getting into the part of the year where we have the uh, best of the year lists, and uh, many critics are including it in their best of the year type lists, uh, looking back at the year cinematically. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a complicated question, and but I do think that it's absolutely right that this should be on people's top lists for both film and television uh, in 2020. And uh, we will see what happens with the uh, Emmys and or Oscars uh, this year, I guess. Well, speaking of end of the year list, at least two of these have cracked my top 20. Uh, so if anyone's curious to check out my letterbox list, I do have them listed as individual films. Uh, but as you mentioned, Abby, I, I it really doesn't matter. It is TV. It is film. They are films. Uh, but you should just watch it. It's brilliant. I, I loved it. And um, I don't know if you saw this, Ben. I think you did. That the um, best reviewed film on Letterboxd this year was actually a TV series, which we talked about in a previous podcast, uh, I May Destroy You. So boundaries are being taken down left, right, and center. And it's probably a good thing. 
So again, my pick is Small Axe by Steve McQueen. And you can see all five films now on Amazon Prime. Well, my pick for episodic entertainment is the French television series, The Bureau, or in French, Le Bureau des Légendes, created by Eric Rochon and starring Mathieu Kassovitz. The Bureau is a spy thriller about members of the DGSA, or the General Directorate of External Security, which is France's equivalent to the CIA. The series debuted back in 2015 and has run now for five 10 episode seasons. And it's been a huge hit, not only in France, but around the world, having now aired in over 100 markets. And you can find it here in the US on Amazon Prime, uh, as well as Sundance Selects and on DVD, uh, for those of you who prefer physical media, from Kino Lorber. And also check your local libraries, they may have it uh, in stock there. There are very few spy stories that bear comparison to the work of the great novelist John le Carré, who sadly died just a few weeks ago in December, but this is one of them. Le Carré, of course, was the author of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and The Night Manager, among many other classic works, many of which have been adapted into excellent film and TV series as well. The spy world is necessarily intriguing, and there are occasionally action sequences, here in the Bureau. And yes, the characters' sex lives are pretty integral to events as well, but you do not get any further away from James Bond cartoonery than the kind of work Le Carre did and that Rochant and company here are doing with the Bureau. As the name implies, the focus here is work life in all its mundanity, the long hours, the office politics, the inefficiencies, the grind. It's just that the job here is placing agents in foreign countries under deep cover, keeping them alive, undetected, and placed in a position to gain intelligence. And the agents undercover must establish believable new identities in whatever field they're employed in, and never blow their cover, neither in a mundane setting nor under duress. It's the definition of a 24-7 job. The series star is Matthew Kasovitz, codename Malo True, which translates roughly as pain in the ass real name Guillaume Debailly, but who in episode one is closing down a six-year deployment undercover in Syria as Paul Lefebvre, English professor. And this involves breaking up with Nadia El Mansour, played by Zainab Triki, the Syrian professor of history with whom he's been carrying on an adulterous affair. And in the opening scene, Malachou is giving a report by encrypted video conference to his handler back in Paris, Marie-Jean Duteilleul, played by Florence Laure Cailly. Most of the first season involves Malatru's uneasy reintegration back into real life after his deployment, both at the office and with his estranged family, including his teenage daughter, as well as the fact that Malatru's feelings for the beautiful Nadia were very real and not just left behind with his discarded identity. I can't divulge much more about the ensuing story arcs because there are twists aplenty, and very strong plotting from episode to episode and season to season, which includes various ongoing missions taking place in Algeria, ISIS-occupied Syria, Iran, and other surprising and unexpected locations. If you start watching, take care not to read ahead, not episode summaries, not Wikipedia, not even the back of the DVD for upcoming seasons. You don't want any of the surprises spoiled for you. One thing remarkable about the series is the up-to-the-minute references to real-life current events and crises, especially the Syrian civil war, and the hierarchies, rivalries, and institutional prejudices with how the French intelligence services see their role among their international peers is fascinating to listen in on. And it's this realism that gives the series its engrossing power. The problems are real, the characters wrestling with these challenges feels real, even the limited action sequences are grounded in real-life, believable scenarios, no pyrotechnics needed. And Rochant has cited his admiration for 70s-era U.S. political thrillers as an influence, and I think that comes through here. I mentioned the excellent writing and series conception, but that can only be as good as the players interpreting it, and the cast here around Kasovitz is extraordinary. I already mentioned Florence Loreke and Zainib Triki, who are series mainstays, but also the excellent Jean-Pierre Derosin as Henri Duflo, who is the director of the uh, unit that Malachou and others are a part of, and a very much uh, rumpled, avuncular figure within the department, codename Socrat. 
Also, Sarah Giraudot as Marina Loazo, codename Phenomen, a trained seismologist undergoing rigorous training to become an undercover agent with her first deployment set to be in Iran. Gilles Cohen plays Colonel Marc Loret, codename MAG, which is an acronym for Moul a Gof, which would translate to being Waffle Iron. Some of the more unusual nicknames uh, are revealed where, what their source is uh, somewhere in season one or two. It's very funny, and I'll let those of you who choose to watch the show discover it for yourself. Jonathan Zakai plays Raymond Sisteron, a handler and an agent and a compulsive womanizer. Pauline Etienne as Céline Delorme, a young Middle East expert. Jules Sago as Sylvain Ellenstein, a specialist in surveillance and computer tech. And Mathieu Demi as Clément Migaud, head of the Iran service. Demi, who is the son of filmmakers Jacques Demi and Agnes Varda, also directed several episodes of the series, as did Mathieu Kasovitz and as did Eric Rochon. And in later seasons, the series welcomed some excellent additions to its cast, best known for their film work, including Mathieu Amalric as Jean-Jacques Angel, who's, uh, a, who is the director of the DSEC, and Louis Garel as undercover agent Mille Sabor, uh, translates as 1,000 Sabres, who's under deep cover in the Arabian Peninsula as an arms dealer. Both of them are outstanding in their roles and were focal points of excellent new plot threads in the later seasons. So where does the series stand now? Series creator Rochon has declared that he's done after five seasons, and the final episodes do have the feel of a chapter closing. Also, not without controversy, as, like with The Sopranos finale, fans have been divided about how things have, for now, ended. But there's talk of a season six and certainly loose threads to return to should the baton be passed to suitable hands. Whatever may happen in the future, I submit that these 50 episodes of the Bureau constitute one of the best things done in episodic television in the past decade anywhere, and also a key entry in the canon of smart spy fiction. So I highly, highly recommend checking out the Bureau. Well, I know we're all big fans of Matthew. Kasovitz's Lahane, which we talked about a few, well, actually more than a few podcasts back. Uh, so it's really great to know that he directed episodes in the series as well as, as starring in it. Um, so yeah, hopefully there's going to be more and I need to start. I've got lots of catching up to do, basically. I need to start from the very beginning. <laughs> Abby, I do think you would really like the series. And uh, we talked about this a little bit when we discussed the hen a few week, months back when it came out as a re-release. Uh, but Kasovitz's filmmaking career, sadly, has been kind of sidelined. But um, and I, I mentioned this back then when we were discussing that film, which really, you know, debuted with a big splash for this then I think still in his twenties young filmmaker and actor. So it was for me really interesting to come around to understanding that where he's really found his place is in is in television and uh he's very much the star of the show he's excellent and yeah he's keeping his hand in um still as a director just on the episodic television side yeah and this is uh not the first time the show's come up on the podcast or in our conversations and it seems rightfully so but i still haven't seen any of it and i really want to uh, but i think it's it's also nice that we're, we're highlighting international television series uh with abby's pick and your pick um, because we don't necessarily do that often. Um, and even kind of as a, as a whole, we don't watch, uh, series that aren't in, you know, made here in the U S. So, um, to be able to highlight that kind of stuff, I think is good in expanding our, our horizons in terms of TV. Yeah. I certainly haven't investigated that much in, uh, foreign language television, uh, so, sort of discounting UK and, and Irish productions, uh, English language productions, which of course we get a decent amount of, um, of available here and, and which find a receptive audience. I'd have to go back more than 10 years, uh, to, to recall the last time that I, uh, stayed with, uh, uh, a non-English language international television series with, um, the killing out of Denmark, which of course was a sensation and, and also eventually remade in the U.S. And I know there's talk about uh, remaking the Bureau in, in other markets, including the U.S. Apparently, Paramount has the rights to do so. But and this is something I discussed with my wife, who I, I watched all these episodes with. It's it's just not a one to one transition 
uh, translation to to imagine a remake. Uh, certainly, the translating that to another setting, but it would lose so much specificity of, uh, as I mentioned before, the French intelligence services and where they see themselves uh, interacting with the intelligence services from other countries and the big foot of the CIA who show up along the way in, in uh, the five seasons of the Bureau. So to, to transpose that to a CIA setting, for example, it just would have none of the same relevance. You'd have to change a lot um, in, you know, to, to imagine it in, in another country's setting. I'm sure that there are writers who can figure out the way that you would translate it, but it would have to, you know, it would change, it would change a lot from what the original was unavoidably. Yeah, and I think um, that is kind of the only way we, we get into these international series is they're so popular that they're remade um, or just a quick plug for, for anime. I think there's a big fandom of, of anime here in the U S but yeah, besides that, we don't really get it. So maybe this one won't get remade ultimately. And that's maybe for the best. Well, and you know, you could also say, having it remade may make more people aware of the original. And uh, if, if people are then motivated to seek out the original, I guess that's a good thing too. But you're, you're right, Ben, there's a lot of good work being done in international uh, episodic series. And I, I know also with those end of the year lists, I just uh, perused one from Variety highlighting uh, 10 or 12, I think it was, of the, of the best international series, most of which uh, I had not yet heard of. I think maybe Normal People was the only one that I was familiar with. And a lot of them sounded really fascinating, including uh, a number of them were the work of people, you know, names that we're familiar with from um, the feature film side of things who are, you know, also doing television work in their home countries. So, yeah, I think there's a, a lot to explore out there. So once again, that's the Bureau and you can find it on Amazon Prime in the U.S. And it's also out on DVD from Kino Lorber. All right, that wraps it up for this week's edition of Silver Streams. Thank you all for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope that you see something that you love this week. Bye, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, stay safe and have a, have a good weekend. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we hope you come back again next week for another episode of Silver Streams. A reminder to our listeners, you can find everything currently available in our virtual screening room on our website at afi.com silver and a portion of the proceeds from screening these titles at home goes to support AFI Silver Theater. If you have any feedback or questions, you can email us at silverinfo at AFI.com. You can also get in touch with us or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at AFI Silver Theater, and on Twitter at AFI Silver. The music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. To find more of their work, visit their website, sessions.blue.